we are back in Romans chapter 2 again, making our way through um, Paul's argument with regard to sin and judgment. Uh, in the first chapter, he spoke of the corruption of our human nature, particularly with regard to the nations of the world. In the second chapter, he begins to turn his attention to the Jew who considers themselves uh, morally superior. They're able to identify with Paul the corruptions of the pagans and take some comfort in the fact that they see these corruptions and yet Paul bursts their bubble by saying, listen, you might know what's going on, but the problem is you not only know what's going on is evil, but you also do the same thing. So when you judge other people, you're judging yourself. And so there's a reflex here which they had not anticipated. Uh, and Paul is in the process of exposing the guilt and the corruption of the Jewish man as well as the Gentile, that they're in really the same, uh, same boat, as it were, uh, still together subject to the wrath of God because of sin. So he's uh, beginning to open up uh, the Jewish religious person, uh, the one who is concerned about law and observance of Mo the law of Moses and so forth. He's trying to show uh, slowly but surely that even though they have the law, they are descendants of Abraham, um, they know what's good and what's evil, they have a better understanding of morality than what you will find among the pagans, Nonetheless, that will do them no good when they stand before God for that final judgment. They, too, will be shown to be sinners, those who break the law. So, uh, Paul is developing that case, but there's also another line of argument that Paul is making here with regard to God and his fairness, his justice, um, his uh, work of... Uh, bringing judgment on the wicked needs to be uh, defended, if you will. Is God just to punish the Gentile and the Jew? Um, on what basis do they have similar punishment? And we can think of that today in modern terms. If you're in an evangelical church or uh, some uh, contemporary forms of Christianity, um, you'll find people who say that, well, God doesn't judge all mankind um, because not everyone has heard the gospel. Why would God punish the, you have to go back in time, go, why would God punish the, the African who's never heard the gospel? Will he not give them a, a, an opportunity, at least after this life is over, to hear the gospel for himself and then to decide one way or the other whether he will follow Christ or not? And so there's the idea that there will be uh, an opportunity for the uh, heathen, to use an old word, the pagans, uh, to hear the gospel for the first time and make a decision for Christ or not. And uh, so if we are speaking with somebody like that, we would say to them, well, God is just to condemn those who have never heard the gospel of Christ because they have the law of God written on their hearts at the very least. And they know the right thing to do, and yet they do not do it. Um, so we're going to take a look at that aspect of things where uh, the wickedness of mankind is developed here in relationship to the law of God and demonstrate that God is just in the way that he applies that law to each one. Uh, at the end of our discussion last time, we come to the 11th verse where Paul writes that for God shows no partiality. And so um, th there's... Uh, the same bar of justice that applies to both the Jew and the Gentile. It does not show partiality to uh, a favored race, to a favored religious community, uh, to um, those who are wealthy, prosperous, uh, as opposed to those who are poor and, and sinners, uh, as the Pharisees used to uh, distinguish the common people. Um, God shows no partiality. His judgment is um, according to actions and, and uh, um, based on his law. And uh, so the, uh, Paul is, in, in a sense, defending the justice of God. Uh, we'll pick up our reading today at verse 12 and go through verse 16. And uh, 
make some comments on that. Paul writes, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, and while, and their, excuse me, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So, uh, we're continuing to develop the, the sin of mankind and our liability to, to judgment in these verses. Um, and the, the, the subsidiary theme then is whether God shows partiality or, or not. Does he show favoritism to the Jew as opposed to the Gentile who re receives no benefits from God? Is the Jew accepted because he's a child of Abraham, because he knows God's law, because he hears it read to him from Sabbath to Sabbath? Does God extend favor to the Jew on those terms while condemning the Gentile? Um, yeah, there, there's kind of a, a feeling among some today that um, justification is in some way connected with church membership and being a part of the Christian community. And as you're a part of that Christian community, you are saved. And uh, while clearly there's overlap, we need to be very careful not to make that identification between the two. Uh, membership, mere membership in the church and the Christian community is not um, a fail-safe um, indicator that you are indeed among God's elect, that you are indeed a true believer in Christ and you will indeed be saved. That external membership is not sufficient to save. Um, as you come into the church, you give a credible profession of faith, hopefully, and the, the session in a Presbyterian context will listen to that and uh, charitably uh, receive a confession that uh, gives evidence of faith in Christ and bring you into the church. The session can only see the outward appearance, can only listen to the words that are said, uh, can make, a, if you will, a superficial judgment uh, for those coming into the church, and we do the best that we can to make sure that only those who are true believers enter into the church uh, through professional faith. But uh, we may make mistakes, we may overestimate uh, the testimony that's given to us, what have you. Uh, the person may be um, not being honest with our, themselves or with us as they speak, and so they may not genuinely be believers in Christ. And so that s simple membership in the church uh, does not determine one's justification. Uh, similarly for the Jew, being a member of the tribe of, uh, of Israel, uh, someone who uh, received the covenants, the promises, and all these kinds of things, does not automatically qualify for being a child of God. Um, so, there's no partiality on God's part. He examines the hearts. He sees what's genuine. He distinguishes the true from the false and uh, judges accordingly. So in verse 12 we get into this discussion of all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. And what is this law that he's speaking about? Well clearly it seems to me he has in mind that special revelation of God given in Scripture uh, summarized by the Ten Commandments under Moses uh, that is the law of God that's been revealed and given to the Jewish community. Uh, that's their special treasure and blessing. Uh, but the Gentiles have not received that. They uh, were not there at Mount Sinai. They did not receive the Torah, the copies of the law. They've not 
had the Torah, the, the law read to them from Sunday to Sunday, Sabbath to Sabbath, I should say, the Gentiles were without this written, revealed law code. And so therefore are the Gentiles, the pagans, uh, liable to judgment. If there's no law, can there be any sin? They don't have a law over them in a written form. Uh, but as Paul makes the case in Romans chapter 5, uh, uh, those who sinned uh, prior to the expression of the law, uh, let me just take you right to that if I can quickly. Oh, and I don't even have this up on the screen for you. Sorry about that. Although it was nice to see your faces in living color. <laughs> We'll uh, zoom here to chapter 5, where in verse 12 he writes, For just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For indeed, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose it's sinning was not... Uh, pardon me? I didn't hear you. You lost the sound. I want to have you. You, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. okay. All right. So Romans 5, verse 12, Paul talks about, uh, and following, Paul talks about how even though the, the nations of the world did not have the law of God given, even you know, prior to Moses, all the generations of humans uh, from Adam to Noah and from Noah to Moses, all these people still died and death is the wages of sin. So therefore, if they died, they sinned. And if they sinned before the law, well, did they have a law? Well, clearly there, there was a law. Um, in uh, Romans 5, um, Paul is talking most uh, uh, focally on the impact of Adam's sin and the law in the garden, don't eat from the tree of, of, of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat thereof you will die, and that sin passed on to his uh, descendants, the original sin and the guilt of that sin passed on to all mankind. But in chapter 3 here he's emphasizing the fact that uh, God's law, can, chapter 2 I should say, um, emphasizing the fact that God's law passed on or, or, or were still um, ruling the hearts of all mankind even though they did not have this special written law given to him. So Paul's going to argue that uh, God's law is actually written on the hearts. It's part of our nature. It's who we are as creatures of God. Um, he didn't develop it this way, but you might be reminded that we're all created in the image of God. That image of God is uh, not only an intellectual image that we're able to think and uh, understand things and communicate, that sort of thing, but it's also uh, a moral uh, aspect. We're made in the image of God and we reflect His character. There's righteousness, love, patience, uh, all these kinds of things. So we have a moral law code ingrained within our natures. Now, that image of God is defiled by sin. Following the, the sin of Adam and Eve, their, their nature was corrupted. They began blaming each other for their sin rather than taking ownership for themselves. But the fact is that the law of God was written on the heart. And so that's what Paul is going to argue here is that those who sinned without the law, that is without the specific special revelation of the law under Moses, those who sin without that law will also perish without that law. They still perish. Um, again, picking up Romans 5, death reigned from Adam until Moses. You know, it's not like um, they, they escape from the penalty of the law. Uh, all sin without the law will also perish without the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. The second portion of verse 12 is something that we would all understand. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. That's the whole purpose of the law, to judge us. But for the Jew, when they're listening to that, they might be saying to themselves, well, since I have the law, I'm justified. 
that's a mark of the fact that I'm elect. I'm among God's chosen. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I have received the law and the covenants and the promises and so forth. And so therefore the, the presence of the law in my life goes to the effect of saying that I'm not under the law. I'm saved by it, by observing it and keeping it and so forth. Uh, but Paul says, all who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Now, some of the religious-minded Jews might be saying, well, yes, there are the publicans and the sinners and all the tax collectors and all those who are sinners and they break the law of God and uh, they are you know, in a good degree of trouble there because of their sin, so they will be judged by the law. But we who are religious, who are pious, who try to keep that law and observe it faithfully, uh, we are uh, above the sentence of the law. But Paul is going to be zeroing in on them and saying that all who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And that's going to include the pious religious Jew as well. There's no escape for him from his religious observance. So, uh, you might be mindful of the conclusion that Paul comes to in chapter 3 for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, this is uh, true of all men, whether they are Jew or Greek. Verse 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And so here we get to, again, zeroing, zeroing in on the pious Jew, the religious Jew, who has regard for the law of Moses, who has it read to him Sabbath after Sabbath, uh, and, and takes comfort in that. Um, and, and that opens up the question for those who attend ch Christian churches and uh, hear the scriptures read to them from Sunday to Sunday. Do you count that as part of the evidence for the fact that you are a Christian, that you attend the services, you hear the word of God, um, you have fellowship with the believers and that sort of thing. Is that what gives you confidence that you are among God's elect? Well, certainly I think it is. it can be an indication of that, that you are indeed one who is saved by grace, uh, that you have a love for the law of God. But if it, it's merely something that you hear and then you walk out without doing it, without obeying the Lord in your life, then that really calls into question whether you truly know the Lord. So here it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, we talked about this last time as Paul, uh, in verses 6 through 11, uh, spoke about those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality will give eternal life. You remember he had this uh, chiasm, this structure to his argument where he speaks of uh, believers who obey the law and will be judged accordingly and will be saved in view of the fact that they are among those who obey the law of God and observe that law. That's the expression of their genuine faith uh, that works, a faith that obeys the Lord. That will be taken into account in terms of their final justification. Do you have genuine saving faith that rests in Christ alone for salvation and that genuine faith shows itself by a life of good works? Um, here in verse 13, uh, Paul says, the doers of the law will be justified. Well, to, to that extent, for believers, as they do the law, as they observe the sanctity of marriage and of life, the sanctity of private property, of family and worship and so forth, and serve the Lord uh, from the heart, uh, those good works are evidence of the fact that they have genuine saving faith that they are justified by that faith and therefore uh, they will be justified on that final day when they're declared righteous before God. Um, but in, in particular, those who want to take comfort in the law and their own personal obedience to that law without necessarily committing themselves to Christ or believing in Him for the atonement of their sins and uh, for everlasting life, um, those who take comfort merely in their uh, observance of the law outwardly, um, they will find that 
it's the doers of the law who will be justified, and the law requires perfect obedience in order to receive that justification, and on that rock we will all be destroyed if that's what we pursue. So, uh, Paul says, it's not the hearers who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law. Verse 14, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. As I've been reflecting on this set of verses, I'm uh, reminded of our doctrine of total depravity. And this gives us some nuances to our understanding of that doctrine. In total depravity, we say that uh, every aspect of our human nature is corrupted by sin. Our mind our will, our emotions have all the taint of sin, corrupted by sin, and we are enslaved to sin. We can only sin by what we do uh, in one form or another. Even our best works fall far short of God's perfect standard. I believe it's Isaiah who says that your righteousness is as a filthy rag in God's sight. Um, so all those things that you might take some comfort in, the good works that you do, uh, in and of themselves, fall short of God's righteous standard. Now, that doesn't mean that we are as corrupt or as evil as we could be. When you look out into the world, you find that there are many people who live outwardly moral lives. They may raise their families, they may be faithful to their spouse, they may uh, be good citizens in the community, they might take part in various uh, efforts to show charity to the poor and the weak, that help out their neighbor and that sort of thing. And so they live outwardly, generally speaking, good lives. They might have their weaknesses here and there. On a Saturday night they get knocked out <laughs> drinking. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, they live outwardly good lives. And so the question is, how does this fit in with the idea of total depravity? And, and Paul points out here that there's a sense in which the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. How is it they're able to do these kinds of things if they're totally depraved? Well, it's because they're still made in God's image, fractured as that image is, it still shows some glimpses of God's righteousness and perfection. And so, uh, even among the pagan and the wicked, sometimes we can see uh, good things that are done. You think of what Paul says in Romans chapter 13 when he talks about uh, the duty of the Christian to obey uh, their rulers. And the rulers have the sword given to them and they're responsible for uh, upholding justice and punishing the wicked. Well, that's a good thing. And, and Paul has regard for that. But who is he speaking of? In his day, the rulers are, are mostly the Romans. Caesar and uh, Pontius Pilate and people like that. And yet Christians are to submit to and obey these rulers because they have their, their good in mind uh, by punishing the wrongdoers. Uh, so uh, pagan rulers do not have God's revealed will gu guiding them in their decisions. They're guided by their, if you will, inner light, by their, their sense of moral responsibility, um, they nonetheless can do good things. We need more of them in our government today. <laughs> um, but uh, there, at this, uh, you, you might, for examples in the Old Testament, you might think of Abraham and Sarah and you know, remember him being with uh, first Pharaoh in Egypt and Abraham was concerned that Pharaoh was going to see Sarah as a beautiful woman and want her for himself and bump off Abraham. So they lied to Pharaoh's and to his uh, uh, servants about Abraham's relationship to Sarah. And then it turns out uh, God speaks to Pharaoh and says, don't touch this woman. And Pharaoh calls Abraham in and rebukes Abraham for lying to him. So here is a situation where the believer is rebuked by the unbeliever, by the pagan. Uh, who has a higher moral standard than what Abraham was operating on right here, at least at the moment. At the moment. And, and then this occurred again for Abraham with 
uh, I think it was uh, Abiathar uh, 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 nearby. Rick, do you have a correction? Abimelech. Abimelech, yeah. Abiathar was a priest, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, he was a priest. Okay. So Abimelech, um, it, a similar situation where uh, Abimelech had to correct Abraham as well. Um, and that occurred with Isaac and Rebekah as well, same sort of situation. So there can be evidence of uh, upright behavior, moral standards among pagans to a certain level. Um, they're not doing it in the service of God, uh, in, in obedience to Jesus Christ. They're doing it for their own motivations, for the glory of Rome or what have you. Um, but uh, still, there's, there's a certain measure in which they do what the law requires. Um, I think uh, Murray, in his comments on here, speaks about the, the they do the things of the law, uh, is how he, he translates it. And, and it's you know elements of the law that they take and they observe. They don't do the whole law. They don't keep the whole thing perfectly in all of its parts, including you know the, the goal of pleasing God uh, and in obedience to Christ and that sort of thing. They do it for other motiv motivations, uh, different goals and standards and so forth. But there are elements of the law that they have. And so they might be very upset uh, with the, an act of adultery, very upset with a theft of property, very upset with um, murder, and seek to punish these activities uh, within the community. Um, and therefore, they have a... a, a if, if you will, a shard or an element of the law of God that they hold to pretty clearly, at least when it applies to others. <laughs> and uh, with, with that, they observe uh, God's law uh, and are doers of that law. So it's not that the Gentiles do the whole law of God perfectly. They have an element of it, if you will, a, a, a shard that is broken off from the whole but still reflects the glory of God and, and his uh, law, his dominion over us. And so there's that bit that the Gentiles will do, even though they don't have God's revealed law given to them. Uh, they do this by nature. And again, it seems to me that points to the fact that the law is written on the heart. Um, that, as Paul will say actually in verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So here you have uh, God himself revealing his moral nature within our very constitution, within our souls, as part of who we are that we have a reflection of the moral law of God within us. And that cannot be um, escaped. And so we are without excuse when we, we sin, even though we don't have Moses and the law and the prophets and so forth, we're still accountable to God. Uh, but that work is written on their hearts. Now that's in distinction to what happens to the believer when we are saved and brought to Christ and uh, the prophets talk about how the law will be written on our hearts and will not have hearts of stone, but hearts of flesh. And we are thereby enabled and empowered to obey the law of God uh, in a way that the pagan cannot do. Uh, we are enabled to obey the law of God because we want to obey God himself. And we do so by the power of the Spirit and in accord with the, the fullness of God's word the proper standard all the way through and not just a little bit of that law that we like and we, we hold to as long as we ourselves are not particularly guilty of that for, at, the, at the moment. Um, you see, we take the whole law of God, we rejoice in it, and we seek to live accordingly. And we have the Spirit of God at work within us to do that. So we have the law of God written on our hearts in a way which enables us and empowers us to obey God. The pagan has the written law on their hearts, but it's not in with the effect of enabling them to obey God with that same sort of gospel obedience, that regenerated obedience that we have through Christ. Um, it's merely an outward, uh, almost 
contrary to what they would prefer to be doing, uh, but it's what they uh, will do for their own motivations, for their own sake. Uh, so there's the law written on the hearts, but then you also have this other facet of our soul, which is the conscience. And Paul speaks of the work of the conscience here. Some have described it as being like an umpire calling balls and strikes. Um, the umpires for the Phillies have been calling a lot of balls lately. <laughs> the pitching's not been very good. But um, balls and strikes, uh, righteousness and sin. This was good, this was evil. And we have within our hearts and our minds uh, 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 an internal reaction, a, a kind of an internal judge of our own conduct that uh, takes that law and uh, applies it to our behavior and our conscience speaks to us to the effect that, well, here I did well, and our conscience defends ourselves, so we're falsely accused of something. Um, our conscience rises up and says, no, no, I'm innocent of that. I didn't kill my neighbor. I didn't uh, steal his wallet or what have you. Our, our conscience speaks out in defense of us. And, and we can say, you know, with a good conscience, I did this or that. I had no idea that Sarah was Abraham's wife or what have you. Uh, so... Conscience is at work there at times defending us, but it also it accuses us for the ways in which we break the law of God. And so that's where we have this sense of guilt, um, and, and this guilt weighs heavily on us. So uh, God puts this conscience within us. It's the moral reflection of our hearts on the law of God. And uh, we either... Uh, approve or disapprove of uh, our own conduct. Um, Mary points out that there's also the possibility of understanding this as uh, that among the, the Gentiles, the pagans, they have debates among themselves as to whether something is good or evil. And so conscience works within the community at large as they debate and go back and forth over whether some form of conduct is to be celebrated and approved or to be condemned? Is it, you know, in a modern conduct context, is it appropriate to uh, approve of and support those who seek to ha have a different gender? Uh, is that the loving thing to do? Is that supportive of them and helping them to find freedom for themselves? And so should that be encouraged because that's what they feel like as who they are and we should give, help them give expression to that? Or do we say, no, this conduct is evil, it's wrong, it's a delusion. You need to change the way you think about yourself and accept God's interpretation of who you are. Physically, you're a man, and spiritually, you are a man as well. You cannot escape being a man. Or, conversely, if you're a woman, you are a woman through and through, body and soul. Everything reflects who you are. You may be deluded and confused or arrogant such as to think that if I want to be a woman, I can be a woman. Interestingly, this Dylan McIlvaney, I think is his name, who was put on the Bud Light cans, uh, a transgender uh, uh, celebrity on uh, one of the uh, social media sites, um, he first was homosexual and then recently decided, well, I'm going to be a girl, dress up as a girl. And he, he kind of therefore dolled himself up and I don't know how far he's gone with that, but he's made a million <laughs> doing it. <laughs> so um, is this kind of behavior appropriate or not? Well, um, we have the law of God and a conscience that uh, speaks of these things and uh, the community at large can debate them and argue through them and hopefully come to a sensible conclusion. We shall see. I understand that there's been a significant backlash against the Bud Light uh, advertising uh, and people don't like that. I saw one uh, response by Kid Rock, uh, a moral arbiter, <laughs> if there ever was one. <laughs> he gets out his... Uh, AR-15 and boom, 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 boom. That's right. <laughs> he shoots down the Bud Light beer cans uh, and, and has a rather profane response to <laughs> Bud Light. So, um, 
a little something was lost in the moral standpoint <laughs> right there. <laughs> but anyway, um, just give me just a moment. I seem to be having a delivery. Uh, hold on for just a moment. I might have to sign for something. Be right back. As uh, Rich was talking about those conflicting thoughts, accuse or even excuse them, I was going to ask him a question about what does he, how does he think that works out? Maybe he was trying to bring that out with his talking about the transgender person. But, um, but it, could ha it could work out in other, other ways too. I was thinking about what he said about the shard, and I think some of the gang and fans and that type of thing use, you know, the imperfections of some of us maybe as like a stabbing requiem, you know what I mean, to join the circus. I don't even think there's a such thing. It seems like an act to me, or it seems like a, like a trapeze artist trying to get around the facts and use the law against others. Well, it's, there's no doubt about it that the, the unbeliever uh, is always tight roping or whatever um, metaphor you want to use <laughs> uh, to get around the law of God and to get around the fact that he is under the judgment of God. Um, you know, and how many times will does a person have to excuse themselves <laughs> to uh, show us that you know they have no conscience uh, or their conscience or is seared about um, doing what is right? You know, I, th I I wonder if the Democrat Party is even that way right now. <laughs> they, they they are so intent on doing what will destroy this country that they, you know, they think they're doing good to this country when they're doing evil. So, um, you know, and people don't see that with regard to themselves either. Um, you know, the sins that they do only to, are to their harm and not to their good. Uh, and so we it see... Seem, it seems evident that the law is not written in, in some of their hearts, for sure. It's not. They don't. It's obliterated. It, it's obliterated, or it's. They're, they're no. Just, well, the Bible talks about suppressing the truth. So, you know, they've, they've shut the door and locked it. <laughs> you might say. <sad. laughs> the door to the, you know, to the Spirit of God working upon them. Mm. That I guess that would come under uh, the uh, being given over to a delusion that where, where God God just like we looked at earlier where God just gave them over to a delusion. Right. Uh, so they, well, I see that, that going totally on in our country when people want to be transgender. You know, the, you know that they're living under a delusion, as Rich was saying. Their body, their nature, everything speaks, you know, you're a man, but you want to be a woman. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. it's like the, the, you know, the Aesop's fable or whatever it is about the emperor's new clothes. The emperor thinks he has wonderful clothes on, but he's naked. Yeah, he's, he's wearing his underwear or whatever. I think you can't remember exactly the, the story, but yeah. you know, it's... To us who are believers, we, we understand, you know, uh, uh, a, a man is a man. I, you know, he can doll himself up with lipstick and eyeliner and w put a wig on and so forth, you know. But when you hear his deep voice <laughs> or, or, when, or when, you know, uh, he does manly uh, mannerisms and stuff, you know, can't walk in high heels because he trips over himself. <laughs> then there's always that chromosome thing. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, what a bummer. It's just... It's, it, it, I think it comes down to basically Oops. idolatry. And, you know, it's like, I, I am... I'm the creator. I will make myself who I am, who I want to be. It's, mm. it's, not, it's not who God created me. I'll, I'll create me. And so they're, they're, it's just pure rebellion and idolatry, calling themselves God. They, they're making themselves the creator of who they are. Um, and they're wrong. <laughs> it's simple as that. They're not, they're not God. Yeah, we do, we do have a, a proverb in the world about you can be all, where was it? be all you can be, join the army. Remember that? <laughs> no. You can if even I be a had, girl. <laughs> if I had followed that advice, I would have been dead within a year. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, I probably would have, you know, I could see me, you know, pulling the pin on a hand grenade over in uh, Vietnam and, you know, and dropping it at my feet and exp exploding or something because I'm so clumsy. I'm sorry for the interruption to our study. My special order of a case of Bud Light with a makeup kit just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Very excited to try it out yet, so we'll finish fairly quickly here. <laughs> anyway, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I had a delivery, so I had to sign off on something. My new Corvette signed off on it. <laughs> um, so, uh, we're, we're seeing how God has written the law on the heart, the conscience interacts with that law and uh, evaluates our behavior accordingly. And then Paul concludes by talking about uh, the final day of judgment when, uh, according to my gospel, Paul is not using language which is relativistic, saying this is how I feel about things, this is my gospel, you have your gospel, I've got my gospel, this is what I... No, the, first of all, Paul is the apostle of Christ Jesus. That's how he began himself, introducing himself in, in the beginning of the letter. He is one who's authorized to declare the gospel of God, uh, the revealed way of salvation given to us in God. And so uh, this is my gospel in the sense that Paul is one who, who personally owns it for himself. Uh, he's received it and rests in it for himself, and we should also look on the gospel as this is my gospel, this is what I hold to, uh, but there's an absolute quality to that gospel. It is the only way of salvation. It's not my gospel and your gospel and somebody else's gospel. You fill in what you want in terms of what the gospel says. Um, it's the gospel that God has revealed uh, to us through Paul, by the Spirit of God, and uh, and it's as well the gospel that is consistent with what the rest of the apostles uh, preached as well. As you recall, Paul went to see Peter and James, um, and I think Peter and James, maybe John as well, uh, and conferred with them before he began his missionary journeys in earnest. <clears throat> but uh, uh, Paul was one who would speak in the preaching of the gospel of the final judgment uh, we uh, began on Saturday our, our look at Paul at Athens, and when you read the sermon that Paul preaches in Athens, he concludes by talking about the day when God will judge, judge all mankind through a man whom he's appointed uh, by raising him from the dead. Um, this is uh, part of the gospel message, the fact that God will judge all of mankind at the end of history and time. And... We can't shy away from preaching the final judgment because there are some perhaps who uh, speak in ways which are not very uh, conducive to uh, faith and obedience. Uh, but w we need to explain clearly what uh, it awaits all of mankind as we look to the end of our personal lives and at the end of history. God will indeed judge all mankind. And that's consistent with uh, the law of God being in our hearts. That law shows there's a lawgiver. And if he gives laws, then there's going to be accountability for obeying or disobeying those laws. And that accountability ultimately comes at the final day 
So there's a lawgiver, then there's a conscience, which is kind of like a prosecuting attorney or a defense attorney within us arguing the case as though we were before the court of judgment, uh, standing before God. And so the conscience is kind of a precursor to that final day when uh, God examines the heart and exposes our sins or our guilt or what have you and renders judgment accordingly. Um, Calvin noted that the, the function of the conscience uh, comes through this life but ultimately finds it, its uh, uh, final answer in the judgment when conscience will join with God's judgment and, and confirm that God is just in his judgment of us that in fact we were sinful. That doesn't mean in this life that our conscience is always accurate. Uh, our consciences also can be corrupted and polluted by sin. And we might have a conscience about certain things that that is wrong. Um, maybe our conscience says we shouldn't fight to defend the country. Well, uh, I think your conscience is not well instructed. Uh, that when the country is engaged in a righteous righteous cause, we should go to defend that uh, defend the country. Well, that's just a brief example of how our conscience sometimes needs to be instructed and uh, better informed as well. But in the end, God will judge all mankind, and Paul speaks of that as the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So nothing escapes God's purview. Everything is held open before him. Uh, we can hide things from each other, even from ourselves. <clears throat> but God sees all things, remembers all things. We forget <laughs> the bazillion things that we've done day after day after day for 20, 30, 50, 60 years, what have you. We forget the little things that have done throughout the course of life. You know, it, it, it is a it is a, a a difficult thought to think that God is going to reveal things to all who stand at the judgment that we have completely forgotten or or that have not been um, you know we can't recall anymore how many of us can recall what we did when we were ten years old or what we did when we were 15 or 20 years old, you know, as we get older uh, and all. Um, sadly, especially for the unbeliever, sins that they have done are, um, you know, they've been buried, buried by other sins probably <laughs> over the years. So, so the people don't, you know, especially some of the, most wicked things they've done or thoughts that they've had, they, they don't recall them. But, God, but Christ will recall them at the judgment. I just want, Go to, ahead. I want to finish up by noting that God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. And that's an important point. It's not just God, the eternal spirit, judging us for our sins, but it's the God-man, Jesus Christ, who judges his fellow men. And he is one who has obeyed the law of God perfectly, and so he's in a position to judge mankind. He's also the one who atoned for the sins of his elect, and so he's in a position to know who are his sheep and who are the goats. And so he is uniquely qualified to be the final judge of all mankind at the end of history and time. So it's not something that's simply done by God, the Spirit, who has no connection, no understanding, if you will, uh, uh, of what it means to live life in the flesh and to uh, suffer pain and uh, these kinds of things. It's Jesus who bore up with all of the hostility of men who suffered horribly, uh, especially at the cross, finally, who understood death. This one will be the judge, and he will be able to render a faithful 
just and true judgment. So just as he is a sympathetic high priest for us in heaven because he bore our flesh, so also he will be a final judge because he bore our flesh uh, faithfully at the end of the time. So this is the one whom we serve through repentance and faith and the one whom we look forward to seeing uh, at the end of history and uh, at not just at the end of history but when we pass from this life um, Jesus Christ our Savior and so um, we know the judge <laughs> by God's grace mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, what a blessing okay. well, how, many, how, many how many times in scripture has Jesus does it say something to the effect of um, but Jesus knowing their thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> now, right. It's, now, anytime we think that we've arrived, yeah. we just have oh, to my. think about that. That every time we think that we've followed the law perfectly or really well, yeah. think about our, our thoughts and, and really it just shows how much we need his righteousness in our, because we are, we can't escape the sinful nature. We need him. Mm -hmm. That was Paul's experience in the Romans 7 where he talks about how you know, he, mm. he kind of flattered himself he was doing well, but then he got to the 10th the commandment, you, you shall not covet. And that was the, the internal things that go on in the heart and mind. And now all of a sudden he realized just how guilty he was before God. You can't, you know, you might be tempted to interpret the law of God externally. I didn't murder somebody literally, physically kill anyone. I didn't commit adultery for, with anyone. I didn't steal something. <clears throat> so therefore I'm okay. Did you cuff it? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that tenth commandment goes back through all the rest of them and interprets all of them. So that did you covet someone's property? Did you covet someone's house and life and, and wife and family and position in the world and all these kinds of things? Wow. No, and the rich young, the rich young man is another example. The, the rich young man who got very upset when he was told to sell everything, so, his his, yeah. his coveting, even yeah. though he did everything else. Yep. Uh, according to the book, he still coveted in his heart. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a question. I, I feel it's my place to be sad about the unbeliever, but I know there's. Uh, bigger things like the love of Jesus to maintain and, and feel protected by and that type of thing. And I, I just feel like there's something I can do, but I know better. It's You always get what you want. You know what I mean? Uh, you can want to have the believer change and, you know, be redeemed and everything, but, you know, you get what you need. You get what God's will for you is. And just by obeisance and being uh, a good Christian, you can have some of the things change around maybe. But I don't, I s changed my mind about the centricality of redemption. I don't think that's true anymore. I think that's of the beast. Uh, uh, worshiping the beast, it's, we can't control the outcome of others by our own faith. Yeah, it, it, as much as we would like to see others changed around us um, through our testimony or what have you, um, that ultimately is in God's hands and we can't change that nature. We can pray for them and continue to bear witness to them and it may be that at some point God will be pleased to change their hearts and their lives and that may come at a point when we're not around <laughs> and we may never know the impact that we had in that person's life uh, one way or the other so you, know, you, just, you can't just discount things I think when we enter into glory we'll see we'll probably be surprised by uh, some of the ways in which we minister to people when we didn't even know it um, and, and we'll be surprised to, to see that <clears throat> but um, I, I think 
uh, for ourselves, we need to be faithful to the Lord, trust Him. Uh, his promises that if we seek first His kingdom and righteousness, these things will be provided for you. So we trust Him to provide for our earthly needs in the course of this life. Even so, Christian people suffer. Christian people are tortured and die. Um, and we go through the ordinary uh, problems of life as well with uh, you know, weakness of the body, aging, disease, ultimately death. So um, we were with Eve Thomas, I shouldn't say her name. We were with Eve uh, on Sunday and she was asking uh, us to pray for her that her eyesight would be restored. She's 99 years of age. Well, I can certainly understand that. Um, and and it, there may be some medications that would be of benefit to her or something that could be done that could be helpful for her. I, I don't know. But we do recognize that the body just is going to decay. I mean, that, that's just the way God has designed things in this world. We are under, we are subject to the curse. We, we decay, we grow old, and we're going to die. And as we decay, the eyesight goes, the hearing goes, the mind doesn't think as well as it used to. You know, the, the body doesn't work quite as well as it did before. There's aches and pains and so forth. And you know, all kinds of things happen as we go down that path towards our pass from, passing from this life. We can pray for some things, but I think, you know, that God may spare her and, and open her eyes in a marvelous way, but ordinarily His plan for us is eventually to die. And that's all part of life in this world. Um, your, your obedience to Christ is not going to change that. <laughs> that it may help you to live a better life and keep you from the kinds of things that would cause you to age more quickly or to suffer a disease here and there more rapidly, uh, but you're still going to die. It's just until Christ returns, uh, death will continue to have its hold on mankind. So, Nevertheless, we did pray for her. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah, I mean... Leave that in God's hands. <laughs> Yeah, we, we know that she probably is not going to get his, her eyesight back. But we, we prayed a prayer that was appropriate for, for a person like her who um, hopefully she understood we love her and care for her and we want her to live without as much pain as possible and so forth. But we have to leave it up to his loving God to do his will in her life. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and he prayed three times that he would be relieved of that. Now think of this. This is the Apostle Paul. Who else prays better than Paul? <laughs> Who else is worthy, if you will, in human terms, of receiving a request than Paul? And indeed, uh, through whom, who performed miracles? Paul himself was used by the Lord to perform uh, wonderful miracles, and yet this thorn in Paul's flesh, God would not remove, and he would have to live life even with that thorn in the flesh and learn to learn to deal with it. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is revealed in your weakness. Perfect in weakness. Yeah. yeah. So. I've been praying for big muscles. I haven't gotten them. <laughs> Strong like bull. <laughs> I'm I'm very grateful that um, that we're we're blessed with understanding the nature of sin to a degree where we know we're under a curse and that nothing nothing will save us except Jesus. The so, uh, 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 so, that Jesus salvation. And that we need to confess and believe in Jesus. And it makes the laws more clear. Not that we're not still sinful, but it makes life as we're here much better. It, 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 without that, it would, it would, I think sin would be so much more intense. Because I, I just remember um, 
Jesus said to, to well, I don't remember, I wasn't there, but, but Jesus said to, to Pilate, your sin isn't as bad as the sin of the Jews that brought him there. And I, that, that, I, I never thought about degrees of sin, and, you know, and how they're punished. And I don't wouldn't really know. But I know that, to me, as a, as a confessed Christian believer, and understanding Scripture, at least to, to the amount I do, life is much better. It's freer. I know I have a, a Savior. And I know I'm not very confident in being judged by another man these days. But I know that ultimately, in the end, I'll be ju judged by the perfect justice. And that, that's a wonderful thought. It's, re it's, it's refreshing in the world today to think that. You know, and that also, the, like, no one to judge. The judge is also one who died for my sins. So, yeah. it, it's a really great way to go through life. And it, just, it just makes me want to be the best Christian I can be. Well, your comment kind of, reminds me of something I should have said, <laughs> and that in, in Paul's writing here, um, he does kind of you know talking about God's partiality. He judges us according to what we have in life. So the Gentile doesn't have the law of God, so he's not going to be judged according to that re revealed law of God in, in its specificity, specificity, and detail. Uh, he's going to be judged with the light that he has. So he's not as responsible as the Jew who had clear, full revelation of the law of God. Um, there, there's differences in accountability there. Um, you, you find this in the Gospels. Jesus talks about the uh, one who uh, knew his master's will and didn't do it. He'll be uh, beaten with more stripes than the one who, who didn't know. Um, so you know, that all gets taken into account. There's a calculus, if you will. God examines each of us in our situation and according to our situation with what we should know and what we should do. And the Jew, or today the modern Christian, has an increased accountability for what they have as opposed to the pagan who's never heard the gospel, never heard the law of God or moral, God, moral law of God, never heard about one God and three persons or what have you. Uh, and so, therefore... Um, they're judged by the light that they have that God has revealed to them. And even so, they sin against what amount of light they do have, and they'll be judged accordingly. But there's that fairness in the, in the way that God judges. He doesn't judge the pagan as though he were at the same level as the Jew um, who had the law of God revealed to him. Um, or, you know, even today for the Christian, the Christian people who have... The law of Moses, but the gospel of Christ, and, and we are of far greater accountability than those of older ages who did not have the blessings that we have enjoyed and received. So, very sobering. Yeah, yeah. Great study. Paul's pretty good, isn't he? He's so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, perhaps. Maybe we'll pursue this further. <laughs> well, I have to go to another commitment. So, okay, uh, it's good to see everybody. Lord Likewise. bless. See God you bless. Saturday or, or what have you, or Friday. Okay. And uh, all right, God bless everybody. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Yeah, I should get going too. Does anything you need to ask me at this point? Any opportunities coming up? Well, I think everybody. We really enjoyed the Easter service on Sunday. Oh, it's fantastic! Oh, really oh, good. Nice. Yeah, I'm glad. When you hear it, uh, you're hearing it on the live stream broadcast. Obviously, Th does the audio come through smoothly, or are there interruptions along the way? Because when I played it back, I start getting these interruptions, like like. There was a couple buffering points. Yeah. It, 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 it buffered once or twice, but it didn't miss. We didn't miss any anything. Okay. It just picked up. It must have gave it a little bit of a buffer, mm. and then we we still heard everything. Okay. All right. So the best. Yeah. 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 So it was it was, it was so, great. Okay. Good. God bless us with technology, and we will use it. You bet. <laughs> very very good. I agree. Well, I'm glad that uh, we had a. A good time together on Sunday. It was a, a good 
good day. Um, so, and Rick had a good study from Dr. Godfrey talking about Ashbel Green. <laughs> Didn't know Ashbel Green, but yeah, we got introduced to Ashbel Green. <laughs> he's a, I guess he was a president of Princeton at one point, but pastor of Second Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and an influential person at the time of the American Revolution. Um, was he a signer of the Declaration of Independence? I didn't hear. No, that. I don't think he was. Yeah. But, uh, apparently he edited or was consulted on presidential speeches. And, yeah, well, how many references the president might have in his speech to God? Yeah. For God's providence, he counted them. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. The, uh, well, the name of the lesson was Intellectual Influence. And Ashbel Green was the valedictorian of uh, the seminary, Princeton Seminary, when he graduated. And so he used him as an example of the influence of Presbyterian uh, intellectual men who are Presbyterian on the nation and um, in politics and education and other areas. And Ashbel Green was, had his hands in a lot of different things, even though he was a minister. People today would probably say, this guy, you know, this guy's not, <laughs> he, he's, he needs to stick to his pulpit and not, <laughs> not be writing papers on education and uh, presidential speeches. <laughs> um, he, was for, he was not for taking the land away from the Indians. Uh, he sp spoke out against slavery. So he was involved in a number of and against dueling, <laughs> like contrary. I object to that. I think there, there, there's value in a good duel. <laughs> <laughs> it clears out the riffraff. <laughs> I challenge you to a duel. I do. Yeah. <laughs> this, this coming week, we're going to be studying reactions against doctrine. And I think we're gonna, that... We're going to follow that. Yeah. Dr. Godfrey, I think, sort of hinted at that this last week because he talked about how uh, in our country it was Congregationalists, the Anglicans, and Presbyterians who had the most influence in the first uh, fifth, maybe 50 years or so of our country or, my, or more. And then all of a sudden the Baptists and the Methodists begin to take over and you know, through their evangelistic efforts, through missionary home missionary efforts, they become the more dominant Protestants in, in They're America. Also, Arminian too. Their theology yeah. was largely Arminian. Yeah, so we may wreak havoc. We may be hearing in this next lesson, which is the fifth lesson, um, how how we dumb down the gospel and. <laughs> how it becomes emotionalism and other things that um, influence America. All right. Well, Lord willing, I'll see you on Saturday morning. Saturday morning. Saturday morning, right and early. <laughs> Nine o'clock. So uh, God All bless. Right. And if not, we'll see you Sunday. At <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, God bless, everybody. Bye.